the Bill Roth II. Which was for cancer. No, uh, that, let's, let's talk about that. So the mini gastric bypass is really not a mini gastric bypass. The mini gastric bypass is a made up name, which I made up because the true scientific name of the surgery is a Bill Roth II loop gastrojejunostomy. And we thought for our average patient that was kind of a mouthful. So a Bill Roth II loop gastrojejunostomy is actually invented by Theodore Bill Roth in the 1890s. And when he did it, that was actually, as you, as you know, before surgeons used gloves or masks. So it's an old surgery. It was actually invented for ulcer disease. Uh, they did some early stomach cancer. And it's still used today, done about 16,000 times a year for um, gunshot wounds, trauma, cancer, and ulcer disease. Up until the development of cimetidine, um, ulcer operations, including the vagotomy and antrectomy, we're using a Bill Roth II, was about the third or fourth most common general surgical procedure in the world. And of course, with the advent of tagamet or cimetidine and the other antacids, um, the incidence of surgery for ulcer disease has plummeted. But basically, the Bill Roth II is a good surgery. It's been around for over 100 years. It's used very commonly, but it does have some disadvantages. It has a, a moderately high incidence of ulcers, and the ulcers always occur at the junction between the stomach and the bowel, and it's known as a marginal ulcer. And that's our big complication. And then we talk about that ahead of time. We tell our patients about it, and we ask them to avoid things that will cause that ulcer. It turns out our rate of marginal ulcers is about what's been reported in the literature for Bill Roth II's in the past, and interestingly, about the same as what's reported for Roux and Y gastric bypass. So a gastrojejunostomy, which is a stomach to bowel connection using the scientific terms, has an incidence of a complication known as a marginal ulcer. And it's around three to five percent, depending on how long you follow the patients. So it's a lot like taking an aspirin. In other words, basically aspirins have an associated gastric ulcer or GI bleeding rate that's around six percent per year. So we're in that same ballpark. Now what the other surgeons are worried about is that that ulcer could be more than an ulcer, it's the bile reflux coming back up into the stomach that they're concerned about. And uh, what we see is that we've got 4,450 patients and bile reflux is a pretty uncommon problem. If it were to be a problem, we've seen it in four patients in that, that study from North Carolina, from Duke, said they've seen it in, in some number of patients. It's easy to modify the surgery to take care of that problem. In other words, what we do is just change the bypass. But we've only seen it rarely, so what we say is the concern that the other surgeons have, which is reasonable, we just don't see very often. So you've talked to how many of my patients online, you think? Yeah. Well, you had to talk to at least 10 to get here, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. So you've talked face to face. Oh, well, well, face to face, all right. Yeah. But you've talked to at least 10 and maybe listened in on the Yahoo message boards. And you've talked to how many patients? Ten, and then, you know, on the... Right, and how many have you talked to? Uh, and how many have you talked to, you think? About 15. And how many have you talked to? I've talked to about 12, and two I called personally on their cell phones. They said right. I could call them and talk to okay. them. Individually. Okay, and so real has anybody talked to any patient who had bile reflux as a problem? No. No. Okay. I, it happens, you know, and so the other doctors are right to worry about it. It just, does, in our experience, doesn't happen very often. If it happens, we generally found it's associated with the presence of gastritis or an ulcer, and we treat it by giving an antacid regimen. So it's very, it's very reasonable that the other surgeons are concerned about it. We just don't find it to be that much of a problem. And we think that over time, our surgery is going to be adopted more and more. We're certainly seeing it around the world where there's less of kind of a fear of it. And my bias is that it's going to be adopted more and more here. Um, but I think it's very reasonable to say, gee, I'm skeptical, Dr. Rutledge. I'm going to choose to have a lap band, or I'm going to choose to have a Roux and Y gastric bypass. Now, let's suppose you chose one of those other choices. We already tried one, <laughs> so that's out. But you could try a Roux and Y. And the problem with the Roux and Y is, the neat thing about the band is you can get out of it. Okay. If you get a Roux and Y, if you call the other general surgeons who do Roux and Ys, just call them blindly and say, I'm Susie Smith, could you do a revision? They'll almost re uniformly reject you. Because <coughs> revising a Roux and Y with that gastrojejunostomy up there uh, near the EG junction, 
That's real surgery. What, can I ask what type of surgeon you are? I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Okay. Well, for us general surgeons, like anybody, when we teach our residents, anybody can operate on the stomach. So when we teach our residents, anybody can operate on the stomach. But when we go up on the esophagus, <laughs> that's real surgery up there. So Rue and Y, when they're up there by the EG junction, unfortunately doing a revision up there is really tough and really dangerous. The mini gastric bypass uh, is very easy to revise. So for example, we've had 39 patients out of 4,450 patients, they've gotten too thin. And there's a complication of the surgeries, they got too thin. The nice thing is, in about 35 minutes, we can revise their surgery. Like you saw, there was a gentleman here from Canada who came up, his, Mr. Turner. He had had surgery with me, he had the eight foot bypass. <clears throat> he had a revision last week and it took 40 minutes. A Rue and Y revision. Now your band failed you, but how long did it take to take it out? 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. yeah, see that's the good thing about the lap band. It's, it does have a high failure rate, but you can fail safe. The Rue and Y, once you've got it, there are very few people that will undo it. So, and then, so let's suppose that the concerns of the other surgeons we could talk about for a second. Let's suppose they, that we got a terrible complication in your wife and she got bile reflux. Well, bring it back. We'll undo it. And we feel terrible about it. I would apologize to you and, and it would be awful. But in 30 minutes I could undo it if you get this thing that bothers the other surgeons. So it doesn't mean that a ruin wise is a, a, a worse choice. A ruin wise is a good choice. There are a lot of very bright, good doctors that choose that. I just think this is better. Um, I think our, our results are very good. I think that um, you can talk to hundreds of our patients. Um, you, it's a, we try and practice in a very transparent way. I mean, I'm sure in your medical practice you don't have a a wacky theater full of people with <laughs> cameras and stuff like that. But right now, for example, we're broadcasting Clinic Live over the internet and what we hope to do is that our patients from Canada and, and from all around the United States can basically participate in clinic, but it also means that patients get the opportunity to kind of see patients, they got to see the staples out. Um, I don't think it's the way we should all practice medicine, but in this area of, of intense controversy uh, of, in bariatric surgery, I think it's real helpful in making a decision. Uh, if you could see a, a practice of lap band patients with everybody doing great and, and follow-ups and things like that, I think it would be more helpful in making a decision. Yeah? I have a, I have a question or a story or something. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what it is.